The AI landscape has evolved so much over the past year. In fact, even over the past weeks, it's made it really difficult for CIOs, data and AI executives to understand what to pay attention to. It's messy. It's difficult to know what to prioritize. And even once you've decided on your priorities, it's difficult to communicate them to people who are not in this field. Now, the premise of this carcast has always been about helping you work through the clutter, go from the complex to the simple. And today I'm going to do just that, at least to two things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break down this survey for you, the AI Readiness Report 2024. Just got published this past week. And if you haven't had time to catch it, don't worry, I got your back on that. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you the key questions you should be able to answer when it comes to Gen AI data and analytics. I'm going to do this at the end of this car cast. You're going to want to stick around for that. And even better, next week, my good friend and industry analyst Sanjeev Mohan is going to join us right here on the car cast. So we're going to go further through these questions, give you best practices on how to answer them precisely. So if you want to be the first one to know when I publish this exclusive interview of Sanjeev Mohan next week, you're going to want to subscribe to the channel down here because you'll get an alert the minute I publish the video. And of course, if you've got questions and input and comments about these questions, as I reveal them to you at the end of this car cast, don't hesitate to start the debate via comments and simply message me the email. I'm giving you my email down here as well as LinkedIn post. All right, let's go through this report, the AI readiness report, just like I did with the Mad Landscape a few weeks ago. And by the way, if you missed that episode, it's going to show up here so you can check it out at the end of this car cast today. This report is something I review every year. I remember when I was at AdScale and we built the data maturity survey, it was by far one of the most popular surveys in the industry because People want to know how they're performing against their peers, if they're ahead or behind. This report is going to give you some indication of what's happening this year. I'm also going to give you this year's insights in comparison to last year's insights so you can get a sense of what's getting better and what isn't. First, context. What is this report about? Who is answering the questions and who's issuing it? There are over 2,300 responses from ML engineers, developers, and practitioners, primarily in the U.S., surveyed between the end of February and the end of March of this year. So this is fresh data. It's done by a company called Scale AI. They, their mission is to accelerate the development of AI applications. They provide training data. They're in the data labeling field. I'll let you check out their website for more information. But the point is, this is not something that's published by Gartner, an industry analyst, published by vendors, so know that. Although, kudos to the team at Scale AI because the report is really well done. It's got some really interesting insights. What are they? Well, the report is 50 pages long. So if I were to isolate just a few key meaningful insights for you today, I would say, first one is pay attention to the Gen AI adoption stats. Last year in a segment called Don't Be an AI Tourist, you can see a link up here for that, I highlighted that only 19% of companies had planned for Gen AI, only 19%. This year, that number has gone down to 4%. Production stats, last year, 21% were in production. This year, 38%. Are in production. So not only are we observing that fewer people are ignoring the topic, right, from 19% to 4 we're also seeing a significant acceleration in companies that are making it across to the production line from 21% last year to 38%. This year, that's an almost 81% jump when uh, Gen AI models in production year over year, and that's huge. Now, when it comes to Gen AI, people have said that we're on the early innings, and you've heard that and I say to that, maybe so, but the better question I think is, how long do these innings actually last, right? I'm not a baseball expert, but I think you you know what I mean here. There's an acceleration in this space. And if you're not looking at this topic right now, if you're on the 4%, you might want to take another look at the topic because Gen AI thinks it's just going to be the standard, the norm for many of your industry uh, peers. Second insight, you'll find the report. What do people use Gen AI for? Now, I think I might actually found a typo in the survey and I'll highlight this in my blog. But I think what matters here is how is the industry starting to think about the deployment of GNAI at their company? We've talked about this before. In fact, you should check out my video on use case. I'm going to put a link up here for you to get there easily. But in my opinion, there are three ways to think about GNAI use cases. The first one is internal customers and external customers. And then finally, embed in existing applications. What do I mean? Internal customers, what I've learned from observing customers is that there's a lot that Gen AI can do to help with immediately 
with very low risk and high reward equation. Internal use cases, they could be about making your data better, about supercharging the performance of your people. And this is across all disciplines and, and departments. This is about creation of content for sales and marketing, uh, starting you off with code for developers, summarization for finance, administrative tasks, and customer support reps is a great example. Like we saw with the Twilio use case where Gen AI is helping the reps find answers faster as they're helping, helping them with next best action. And also after the call, summarizing these calls for what they need to do after that. So really creating uh, more productivity for your employees. So that's the first use case, I think. Second one is the external customers. And we hear a lot about those, of course, because, you know, you think about customer support and chatbot for that, for self-service or even Gen AI in context. The example that comes to mind is Wayfair Decorify, where you can upload a photo of your living room and the application can provide relevant available Wayfair inventory to dress that living room. These, of course, are very inspiring examples that we love to hear about, but they do require very strong architecture to support it and really, really good data to make it work. Uh, check out the video I'm going to put up for you on how Fiona, who is the a Wayfair CTO describes the work she does on infrastructure and architecture first before they get to the external use case. I think that's really important to take a look at. So I'd say these use cases have high reward, but they could also be higher risk if your data architecture is just not up to par for that scenario. Remember that when you're dealing with Gen AI, you're going to activate a lot more end users. So small data problems that before weren't necessarily seen by a lot of people are now going to be amplified because you're you're exposing that to a lot more people. And then finally, the third way to think about use cases here, in my opinion, again, is the embedding of Gen AI capabilities into existing applications, particularly powerful when you have very targeted use cases that rely on applications you've built or used over time, like an ERP or an HCM or a CRM application is a prime example here, because particularly if you know that the data is being used fresh and it is good. You know, what's interesting here is that in the example, say, of an HCM and ERP, the data is not particularly wide or large, but its value and sensitivity is extremely high. So the way you think about the selection criteria for these use cases is going to be different than you might think for other ones. So that's a key consideration. The other insight you'll get from this report is understanding what is the number one barrier that people run into when deploying Gen AI models and applications. Last year, the survey found that data quality and data collection was a huge problem. This year, we're learning that, in fact, the security concerns that have come to the top of the list. Very consistent theme, particularly as people are discovering getting into production. All recent analyst reports have highlighted the same insight. Bark, the cube, when they think about security concerns, in fact, it's a little wider than that. It's about AI governance, grounding and quality, attribution, citation. What this means for you is when you think about the challenge of Gen AI, it's not just about accessing the models, it's about grounding these models and the quality of the data that's powering these models. And remember here by quality, I don't just mean the completeness of the data, I mean how much you can in fact trust the originating data so it can feed into quality of your answers. Remember a few months ago, I came out with this acronym that I think really defines what Gen AI success goes through. And in my mind, it's five key letters to remember, MT, C A C M is for multimodal and input and output image text code math key consideration for Gen AI. You need to think about multimodal and we covered this with Stephanie Wong as well. I'm going to put the link to a video on that. If you want to know more second is T trustable and there's many dimensions of trust, reliability, recency, fidelity, robustness, origination. C is for current. You want to make decisions on data and information that is fresh. A is for applied to a workflow. That's why you've heard a lot about the future of Gen AI to be agentic, to be about agents, because these agents act as part of or integrated into a workflow. And then finally, C is for contextual. That's why people talk about large context windows, because it allows these agents to stay stateful, understand and persist the domain within uh, the right context. And even humans are not always good at that, by the way. And you can ask my wife if, if you want to know more about my personal life. Uh, so there's a lot here in this report, and I suggest you take a look at it, of course. I'll also highlight a few important charts on my LinkedIn profile, if you follow me there, and on my blog. So I hope uh, this can help you think through the key considerations when you implement Gen AI. This report really has got a lot of great insights. Now, as I promised at the beginning of this CarCast, 
There are a few key questions you need to be able to answer when it comes to embarking on your Gen AI journey. That's why next week I will have my good friend Sanjeev Mohan in this car cast to help us out with the answers to these questions. But let's get started with what the questions are. And what are the key questions you need to be able to tackle? And by the way, I'd love to get your input if there are more questions you want us to tackle. The first one is, how should you identify the right Gen AI use cases to pursue? You've heard in my previous car cast stories from Carrefour and L'Oreal where they run these workshops. That's a great best practice, but often the outcome is hundreds of use cases. So how do you parse through all of that? What works? What doesn't? Of course, you could say value here, but what happens when you don't know what the expected value is going to be or how you're going to measure the outcome? I really can't wait to see what Sanjeev has to say about that. And again, if you have best practices, put them in comments down here. Second question, how should you budget for Gen AI? Should you borrow from your existing AI budget? There's a lot of research that indicates that many of you, are, in fact, are doing that. But how much do you borrow? What's reasonable? What's dangerous? We'll tackle that. Then, when not to use Gen AI, this is bound to be controversial. And my favorite is, what do you not know about Gen AI that you probably should? I can't wait to engage with all of you on these topics. Like I said, if you have more questions, comments, and best practices, don't forget to share them in comments or directly uh, with uh, Sanjeev and I. Let us know what you think, and we will see you next week.